Well, I truly appreciate that special. It does fit very well uh, with the message this morning, maintaining internal righteousness despite external evils. And I believe that we can all agree today and say God is only and always good. Amen? Amen. 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 Say amen. 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 Thank you. 2 Corinthians chapter 4, 2 Corinthians chapter 4, truly we serve a wonderful and amazing and almighty God, one that we can glory in, one that we can glorify uh, with our life. As we see in life, there is plenty of external evils that come about. There's plenty of situations, circumstances uh, that we would classify as being difficult uh, we would classify as trials, testings, temptations, challenges, things that we must overcome, things that uh, we are not necessarily happy that we find ourselves in. And one of the things that the Lord has worked with me this week and bringing about through several different aspects is that conviction with, uh, within my spirit, within my heart, that essentially says that the external evil, the external circumstance should not dictate my internal righteousness. But rather my eternal, internal, not eternal, but internal righteousness should be there consistently no matter what. And I believe that this, you'll find this to be a very practical message, uh, one that probably is going to hit home uh, even today in just the circumstances and things uh, that we find ourselves in. In 2 Corinthians chapter 4, I'm going to read a few passages of scripture and then uh, maybe look a few chapters later uh, for some uh, insight and uh, uh, exemplify some of the things that Paul is saying here. Uh, and then we'll come back to this chapter and draw some uh, helps for you and I uh, today in some of the uh, experiences here that Paul places uh, before us. He says there in 2 Corinthians chapter 4 and verse 8, we are troubled on every side. We are troubled on every side. Everybody, uh, anybody ever felt that way? Troubled on every side, right? And uh, by the way, let me just put this into context. Verse 1 of that chapter, that same chapter, chapter 4, Therefore, seeing we have this ministry, as we receive mercy, we faint not. So as we are ministering for the Lord, as we're serving God, as we're striving to please Him, all right? Doing, uh, essentially, we're going we're gonna to establish the fact today uh, that you are in a position that you are pleasing the Lord, okay? Because when we get into a situation of sin and we get into a, a point of disobedience to God, we deserve the troubles. We deserve the trials. We deserve the difficulty. We deserve uh, those reproofs, those consequences of our actions. And so uh, if you're out of the will of God today and things are happening to you, uh, listen, you deserve it. You're getting what is supposed to come to you. Uh, just like at our home when somebody uh, disobeys, particularly uh, the sons and daughters, all right? My wife and I, maybe not as much, uh, uh, at least in this form of correction, right? Uh, the Lord has other ways of correcting us. But when our children uh, uh, disobey, there is a, uh, usually some form of correction for that disobedience, and it's the same thing for us as we walk in the uh, Spirit, as we walk uh, uh, as children of God. When we get out of walking in the Spirit, we walk in the flesh. The Lord treats us like children because we are and because He loves us and He chastens us. And so when there's trouble and there's problems and there's uh, reproofs, then you know what? You need to acknowledge that God is chastening you. Uh, confess that sin before Him and seek His mercy and get right with Him and allow Him uh, to forgive you and place you back where you need to be. But that being said... There are also times in our life as we're walking in accordance to uh, the scriptures, when we're walking uh, under the influence of the Spirit of God, there's still what we would classify as bad things happening. Difficulties that are coming about. Uh, trials that we're walking through and walking in and situations that, listen, we really did not want to have to be a part of. Brother Larry was explaining to me yesterday that he has a, 
an image imprinted upon his mind now because he was uh, just a, a block or a few cars behind a, a tragic accident uh, that occurred uh, when two boys were walking across the street and a car ran into both of those boys at the same time and they go flying in the air. That is not something that Brother Larry is walking around saying, man, I sure deserved to be involved in that. Now, he wasn't driving, praise the Lord, um, but a witness of that. I deserve to be a witness of that. No, that's something that we walk around saying, I wish that never would have happened, and I wish that I would not have had to see uh, that image that now I have to somehow deal with and somehow uh, put aside in order not to become distressed over it. Well, think of what happens with the Apostle Paul. We recognize through the life of the Apostle Paul that he was very close uh, to God and he served God with all of his heart and with his life. I mean, he did things that many of us uh, uh, probably would not be willing to commit to and not willing to go and, and, and accomplish and do. And yet with Paul's life, we recognize the reality was is it wasn't always a bed of roses for him. He didn't always have the Hilton or the mansion to stay in. He didn't always have the most luxurious uh, type of transportation uh, to carry him from one place to the next place. He wasn't always well received from the, uh, the people that, that, of the town that he walks within. And it wasn't always lauded. They didn't roll out the red carpet for him and say, Oh, Paul, we're so glad uh, that you are now here in our midst. And, and what can we do to make your life easier? In fact, the reality is the opposite of those mostly occurred in the Apostle Paul's life. However, what I will say and what I'll encourage us through the entire message is this, he still maintained internal righteousness. Even to the point that he was able to truly rejoice in all of his problems and troubles and trials and difficulties. Now notice what it says here, verse 8, we are troubled on every side. And that word troubled means afflicted. It means to suffer, to suffer. What kind of a suffering do we enjoy? I haven't found any, <laughs> right? What kind of pain and affliction do I just say, oh, I just can't wait to get more of that. Please bring it on in my life. No, that's not the way it is. Nobody likes affliction. Nobody likes to suffer. But he says we are troubled on every side. And yet, here it is after the comma, yet not distressed. Not distressed. Now that was probably the word that stood out to me the most because one of the things that we talk about often in our life is stress, right? Uh, I wear my stress right here. Right between my shoulder blades, right on my, uh, right on my neck starts getting sore. There is the, there is the stress, right? We have the, the stress that affects our health. We have the stress that affects our mindset. We have a stress that affects our attitude. And yet, here's what Paul's saying: I am in the midst of affliction. I am suffering, and yet I am not sorely straightened in my spirit. That's what the word distressed means. I am not sorely straightened within my spirit. Now, uh, straightened, what does straightened mean? The, the, the first thing that comes to my mind when we talk about straightened is when you're walking. When you're walking, now most of you do a good job walking. Occasionally, while we're walking, we stumble, right? And one of the things that you do not want to occur while you're walking is you do not want your leg to stay straight. In fact, why don't you try it from now on? Walk with a straight leg, right? Do not bend. It looks funny. Yeah, I know. Waddle like a penguin, I guess they'd say, right? But if you're actually walking and running and your leg straightens on you while you go to take a step, it creates a lot of damage right there. Uh, I've had it a few times where uh, playing indoor soccer one time, I, I jumped up to kick the, kick the ball in the goal. I don't know if it went in or not, right? Because all I know is when I landed, I had a whole lot of pain and I couldn't walk off the thing without some help. What happened? My leg got straightened and my knee bent inward instead of outward. Uh, frisbee football, the same thing. And what's the moral of the story? Stop playing sports uh, or stop thinking you're younger than you are. One of the two, right? Uh, uh, frisbee football, come down between two bigger guys than me. 
uh, and with just sandwiched like this. And when I came down, my knee went in instead of out. Not a good feeling, right? And what does that do? That creates a lot of problems inside uh, that, that joint and a lot of problems of pain uh, for a good while. Uh, and so here's what Paul's saying. Listen, I'm afflicted and I'm suffering, but in my spirit, I am not distressed. Man, that's powerful. That's powerful to be to say, be able to say that I have a lot of external evils happening around me, but they're still maintaining an internal righteousness. We can also go back to last week's message and we can talk about there's still an excellent spirit. Uh, I appreciate one of the uh, folks that were uh, here last week. Uh, they, they wrote on there uh, uh, somewhere where they could see it. Have an excellent spirit today. Have an excellent spirit today. Man, what a, what a reminder for us, right? We'll have internal righteousness despite the external evils. Paul also goes on, though, to say in that same verse, we are perplexed. We are perplexed. This is a loss with oneself. This is, a, this is essentially having doubt in your mind. Have you ever been into a situation and you're just like, man, I don't know. I don't understand. I am truly at a loss. I don't, I don't understand why it's happening. I don't understand what's exactly going on. Uh, I've said that a lot with this whole COVID-19 thing. I just don't understand. I'm at a loss. I'm, I, I guess I could say I am perplexed about COVID-19. Right? Because there's just so much information, so many things going on that has placed me in a position of doubt and a position of I just don't know what to do. But you know, that's the life that we live. That's the things that come against us. That's the things that are out there. That's the way that life is going to occur for each and every one of us. But Paul experienced the same thing. He was perplexed. I'm sure he was in many situations. I don't understand why they're responding that way. I don't understand why this is happening. But what does he say? He says, but not in despair. Not in despair. Now, you know what despair means? It means to be at utterly at loss. It means to renounce hope. I mean, it's kind of interesting because really with a lot of these terms, the way he describes them, it's kind of like, well, here's the external aspect of it. This is what I'm experiencing. But on the inside, on the, on the, uh, if we were to take this external thing and we were to follow it through into the inside, then what would happen? We would go off the deep end. But that's not what's occurring because the external thing is not, it's not causing me to go deeper on the inside. Instead, it's the opposite. I am not in despair. I am not utterly at loss. I have not renounced all hope. You know, today, as crazy as COVID-19 is, and as much of it as it perplexes me, and I don't know what to do, I can tell you today, I am not hopeless in it. I know that God knows. I know that there is some things that are happening that is, is for the positive. It's God's going to use it and he's going to move within it and he's going to work through it and he's going to help me to get past it. And that's, listen today, that's if, even if I get it. Amen. I'm perplexed, but I'm not in despair. He goes on, verse 9, persecuted, but not forsaken. I can only imagine what it's like to really stand for the name of Christ. To be imprisoned, to be threatened, uh, to have somebody uh, experience harm, whether it's yourself or a family member or a loved one, because of your stance for Jesus Christ. That's persecution. Now, if you're persecuted for your own uh, issues and your own stupidity, hey, shame on you. But when we're persecuted for the name of Christ, that's difficult, but understand, Paul said this, but I am not forsaken. God hasn't left me off. God hasn't quit. God hasn't stopped. I, I guess I'm going through it, but it's not over. He also says here, uh, cast down. Cast down. Again, this can be a, a physical circumstance that, that causes uh, uh, us to be uh, down, if you want to just put it like the scripture puts it. Cast down, right? Have you ever been sick and very, very sick? And then what happens? You're just depleted. Everything's gone and you just can't hardly get out of bed. You're cast down. In the midst of that situation, what do you what, what do you want to do internally? You want to say, "This is just stupid. I don't want to live this life." Lord, you could make me not 
not feel this way. You can make me better. And, and you start to argue with that. But what does Paul say? I'm cast down, but I'm not destroyed. Inside of me, there is something that is still there that the Lord placed there that I can continue to go on. And no matter how hard it is and no matter what I've run through or what I've gone through or what I'm going through, I, the, the Lord is still on the throne and I still have a life to live for him. Look over, if you would, to chapter 11 with me. Chapter 11, 2 Corinthians chapter 11. Paul goes in a little bit further with some of the specific details. And, and, and I can almost just take these things and I can plug them right into that scripture that we, the scriptures that we just read. Uh, his trouble, his perplexing, uh, his casting down, his persecution, things of that sort. But look at verse 23. He says, are they ministers of Christ? I speak as a fool. I am more. And notice what he said he's more in. More in labors, more abundant, in stripes above measure. Now, stripes is not like uh, Kylie's outfit today, all right? We're not talking about the good kind of stripes. We're talking about the stripes that you receive because somebody took a whip and whipped you for the name of Christ. And if you think about it, you read some of the stories of Paul, he experienced just that, those stripes above measure, it wasn't just once. It wasn't just one whipping. I mean, one time, uh, well, I think it says it here maybe, but uh, in prisons more frequent, in deaths oft. He said, wait a minute, Paul, you can only die once. Well, you know, the Lord's working in his life a little bit. There was a few times uh, that uh, he was being stoned, a few times that it was like, oh, I think he's gone, and yet uh, he revived, or times when uh, he was really at the brink of death. In verse 24, what does it say? Of the Jews, five times received I 40 stripes, save one. So how many is that? 39 stripes times five. 39 stripes times five. Now that's a lot of stripes. How many stripes are you interested in having in this world? Zero. Zero. And yet Paul experienced, and, and the Romans were great at uh, uh, whipping. The, they, they knew how much a, a body could take before it died. So they made it as painful as possible, as, most, as, as, as much torture as they could place upon an individual without them succumbing. And 39 stripes is kind of where they found it to that, that breaking point to be. And Paul got it five different times. Could you imagine the way his back looked? I, I think it would be one of those things that if you saw him without his shirt on and you just gasp. <gasps> I imagine he heard that if that was, if that, if that was ever shown. I mean, just the, the creases and the scars. And, and I don't know how much between those, those beatings what the time frame was, but I can imagine that stuff didn't heal that great. And yet Paul still, still had an internal righteousness despite that. Thrice was I beaten with rods. So three times he got beaten with a rod. Once I was stoned. Thrice I suffered shipwreck. I don't know again for you how many shipwrecks you want to experience. But I like to maintain my perfect score right now. Zero, right? <laughs> Zero. No shipwrecks. And yet three times. A night and a day I have been in the deep. You say, oh, that's not too bad. You got to swim for a while, Paul. <laughs> A night and a day. Hey, you know, well, anyways, that's, that's not easy. That is not rough. Uh, try to tread in water for 30 minutes. And then times that by 10. Do it for 30 hours, right? Uh, yeah, he's holding on to something. Maybe he was, but it was at night. It was dark. It was cold. It was damp. You didn't just walk up and get a hamburger while you're swimming. <laughs> This was, this was truly a difficulty. And when did Paul face this? When he was serving God. He didn't face it because he was like a Jonah and running away from God. He faced this when he was doing exactly what God wanted him to do. He says in verse 26, In journeys often in perils of water, in perils of robbers, in perils by my own countrymen, in perils by the heathen, in perils in the city, in perils in the wilderness, in perils in the sea, in perils among false brethren. Uh, what is the common denominator there? Perils. 
everywhere, all the, all, all the time, wherever I went, I could go in the city and I could experience apparel. I could go out in the wilderness in the country where no one else was and I could be in peril. I could be a, a, this and that and all of it meant perils for uh, my life. In verse 27, by the way, isn't this such a great promotion for getting in the ministry? <laughs> hey, everybody, I want you to serve God. You know, here's what you can look at experiencing. But verse 27, and weariness and painfulness and watchings often and hunger and thirst and fastings often and cold and nakedness. I experienced even just the, the basic necessities, the lack of those, whether I was sitting in prison or swimming in the ocean after a, a shipwreck or, uh, or sleeping on, a, a, on a, a, a lice infested straw bed as I'm traveling from one place to another place, uh, whatever it is. Listen, these are the things that has occurred in my life. In verse 28, if we want to put an exclamation mark on it, he says, besides those things that are without what are these the evil the external evils that which cometh upon me daily the care of all the churches so for the apostle paul then it was just the uh, the mindset that he had the ministry that god had given to him that you you were going to be caring for these people you're going to be watching over these people you're going to be ministering these people you're going to be responsible for uh, bringing these people into a a right relationship with me and seeing them spiritually grow and mature and deal with the difficulties like the church of corinth had all of that now listen to me if i'm the apostle paul i don't see how i keep going I don't see how I maintain righteousness with inside that allows me to go to the next city and say, hey, folks, let me tell you about the greatest story you've ever heard. How I go into the next church and say, you know, I know y'all got some things going, but listen, our God is a God of amazing ability to help you overcome anything. But that was again and again the testimony of the Apostle Paul. Let's go back to 2 Corinthians chapter 4 then. I want to give you three things here. And within those three things, I want to give you three aspects of each one of those things. And so uh, what we're going to look at is uh, the item itself. And then uh, we're going to talk about three areas. First of all, what we expect, E-X-P-E-C-T, right? Expect. Second of all, what we reject. And third of all, what we accept. Now, expect and uh, accept sounds like the same, probably especially the way that I say it, all right? Uh, but accept, I'm saying it that way on purpose, okay? Uh, as A-C-C-E-P-T. So you got expect and accept. I know some of you are like, that does not sound right. Well, you want me to say accept? Does that sound better? All right, but don't get it confused with expect. Accept, expect. Two different words there, okay? We'll focus on it as we go. No, we won't focus on that. We're going to focus on what we're actually putting into those places, all right? Number one, the situations. The situations, too many times we get so concentrated on the situations uh, that we just miss all of the, the aspects of what is inside of it or what's behind it or what God's doing through it and how I can maintain uh, uh, the, that internal righteousness, how I can maintain a, a positive attitude, how I can maintain a close relationship with God, how I can maintain a, a, um, a fervency to continue to minister. Oh, that's a difficult one for me. I get into too many troubles and too many problems and too many evils around me. And it's like, you know what? What is the sense? Let's just quit. Let's just go on. Let's just be whatever we need to be and then hope the Lord returns sooner than later. And that's not the way God wants it. Too many times the situation essentially puts upon us the way that we should respond, the way that we should be. And that's not the way it is. Your relationship with God, your uh, 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 information that you've received from the Word of God should dictate what's going on inside of you, not what's out here. So the situations that we deal with, let's look here at verse 10 in, uh, 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 of 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 10. Uh, always bearing about in the body the dying of the Lord Jesus, that the life also of Jesus might be made manifest in our body. For we which live are always delivered unto death for Jesus' sake, that the life also of Jesus might be made manifest in our mortal flesh. Verse 12, so then death worketh in us, but life in you. So when we're talking about the situations, here's, the, here's letter A, expect, expect. Expect difficulties to occur 
when I strive to please the Lord. I'm going to say that again. If you're taking notes, I want you to write this down. Expect difficulties to occur when I strive to please the Lord. Now, now what do I base that? I base that upon on what Paul is experiencing. Paul is going through these things. He's going through these difficulties. And with, with com complete confidence, I tell you today that he is pleasing the Lord, that he's striving to please the Lord. Paul made statements like, I have finished my course. I've, I've run my race. I have fought the fight. There, I, the, I am clear of the blood of all men. I have not shunned to declare unto everyone the co-counsel of God. Paul made those kind of statements in Scripture. They're inspired by God. So I believe this, that Paul strived to please God, and he did a great job at it. But in the midst of the Apostle Paul's life is all of these difficulties that keep popping up, that keep occurring, that keep coming. And my experiences, whether it's me personally, what I've gone through, or what I've seen others go through, uh, there is a great temptation uh, to just uh, uh, kind of quit or kind of get angry or get upset or just have a, a, a mean spirit about you after these things occur. But what I'm finding and what I believe the Apostle Paul, what helped him through this, is that he simply expected it. He expected the difficulties to occur. He expected to be troubled. He expected to be perplexed. He expected to be persecuted. He expected to be cast down. And in expecting that, he also said, listen, when I strive to please the Lord, here's what's going to come about. Now you say, well, pastor, what happens if I please the Lord and it doesn't happen? Praise God, <laughs> right? Uh, hey, but if I expect it, and it occurs, it's not a surprise to me. Too many times I believe that we walk through life with a Hollywood mindset. We have a fairy tale mentality. We want to write the story the way we want it to be written. Oh, I got saved. It was the greatest experience that I ever had. Praise God, it really was. And after that, my life became so blessed by God. I had riches, abundance. I had houses. I had lands. I had cars. And I had the wherewithal to do whatever I want to do for the Lord. And nobody stopped me. And nobody said a word against me. And, and man, this is just, well, listen, that's a fairy tale that you better get out of. Uh, you know, hello, Alice. Wonderland is not around the corner. All right? Let's think about this. Difficulties will occur when I strive to please the Lord. Now, if I expect it to come and it comes, then what, am I, then what does my internal righteousness respond with? Well, praise God, it happened. But then I need to reject this option or this mindset. I expect the difficulties to occur, but I reject that all troubles indicate that I'm not pleasing the Lord. Listen to me again. I reject that all troubles indicate that I am not pleasing the Lord. Did you get that? Think again about that. I told you to expect difficulties when you strive to please the Lord. But I also told you that you need to reject the mindset that says, when trouble occurs, then I must not be doing what God wants. Have you ever experienced something that you were praying about and you were asking God to show you clearly? And as you got into that, you felt like this is what the Lord was indicating. He wanted me to go with this. And as you got into it, just problems happened. Difficulties occurred. And you're like, man, Lord, I thought that this is what, I thought this was your will. And I thought this is, listen, just because troubles and problems occur doesn't mean you're not doing what God wants you to do. If anything, if you're striving to please him and you're promoting him in what you're doing, then you ought to expect that something's going to happen and something's going to come against it. And if I expect that and I, and I reject the concept that it's just all going to just go without any hitch, then when it occurs, I can maintain a, a praise and rejoicing in my heart saying, Lord, thank you for what is going on. And I don't have to be distressed. I don't have to be in despair. I don't have to have that utter loss. Now, here's the problem. How can I get to that mindset? How can I reject that, that natural thinking? Well, that's where the accept comes into. Not the expect, but the accept. Here's what you need to accept today. We need to develop a yielded will grounded in the sacrifice 
of Christ. We need to accept the yielded or my, uh, essentially a yielding of my will, a yielded will grounded in the sacrifice of Christ. I read for you verses 10 through 12. Did you catch up on what was going on there? As Paul talks about these things that has occurred, he talks about the results, same results that I desire in my life. He says, always bearing about in the body, the what? The dying of the Lord Jesus. That what? That the life also of Jesus might be manifest in our body. So what is Paul saying here? He's saying, listen, I am, I'm relating to the fact that Jesus died. That's what I'm bearing about in my body. And Paul said to him in the book of Galatians, he said, I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live, yet not I, but what? Christ liveth in me. So when we see that, we see this concept here of being dead to the flesh. We see this concept of bearing about the dying of the Lord Jesus Christ. Notice verse 11. For we which live always are always delivered unto death for Jesus' sake. Now, is there anything wrong with that? Well, here's the problem. In our typical mindset, we say yes. Well, I don't want to die. If I die, I can't serve God. Now, wait a minute. What did Jesus do in serving God? He gave his life. If Jesus used the same mentality that you and I use, then he would have not done what God wanted him to do. But he went to the cross and he died for your sin and he died for my sin and he paid the price that God would accept. And I'm so grateful that he did, Amen. that he gave his life. Now, if our Savior, our Master, our Lord did that, then how come we can't have that same mindset? How many of us can really come to the resolve today that says, Lord, if it be your will that I give my life for your cause, then so be it. It's not an easy resolve to come to. Think about what I end up giving up. Think about what my family's going to do. Think about the things that I don't get to accomplish. I'm not sure if walking my daughters down the aisle, I'm not sure if I want to do that or not, but... <laughs> Don't get to see that occur. Oh, there's a lot of fleshly reasons why that shouldn't be. But my master and my Lord gave his life for me. Why can't I develop a yielded will that simply is founded in the demonstration of Jesus Christ? You know why troubles get to us? Because we're not living for the Lord. You know why those things bother us? Because we're not willing to identify with the death and sacrifice of Christ. You know, if you look at it from this standpoint, if Christ gave his life and I'm going to bear that in my, my life, then when things happen to me, it's okay, Lord. I'm still living today. I still have opportunity to serve you. I still have opportunity to rejoice in you. Yeah, but don't you realize what's going on in your life? Yeah, but it's nothing like what Christ went through. It's nothing what he experienced for me. Pav, that, that puts it in such a different perspective that allows me then, I believe this, to take any kind of situation that might occur and still have internal righteousness through it. Now, I'm careful to say that, and I hate preaching these kind of messages because I know what's coming. But we are to present our bodies a living sacrifice is what the, body, what the Bible says. Would you do that? Would you develop a yielded will grounded in the sacrifice of Christ? And I can tell you it'll change your attitude in external evil. But let's move on. Number two, the sin. The sin. We talked about the situations. Let's talk about the sin. Here's, here's the reality of what I see from this passage of Scripture. The things that occurred to the Apostle Paul were based in the sinful actions of others. You catch that? Persecutions, trouble, perplexed, forsaken. I mean, these things that happened to the Apostle Paul. Stripes, imprisonment, stoning, perils in the deep. I mean, if you remember, and you say, well, that wasn't his fault. That was the storm's fault. 
Yeah, but remember what he told him? He said, look, guys, we better not leave. And he said, forget you. We know what we're talking about. You're a preacher. We're sailors. We know how to take, take on the, the weather and the ocean. And they went out, and then they, everything fell apart. Paul, listen, listen, uh, follow with me, all right? Give me about 15 more minutes of your attention. I, I know if you can't breathe right now, just slide the mask down. <sighs> suck a couple big, big, big breaths in. Get that oxygen flowing again, all right? Think about this, though. The things that occurred in Paul's life was because of the sin of other people. Was it right for them to do that? Was it right for them to whip Paul for what he did? Was it right for them to put him in prison? Was it right for them to uh, take him and, and, and stone him? No! And could God have stopped any one of those things? Of course he could have. But here it is, the sin of other individuals is now caused an external evil against the Apostle Paul who is striving to serve God. And can I offer you today, it's no different for you and I in our life. The sin of others will bring about external evils in our life. Therefore, expect it, right? So expect, letter A, the sin, expect. Expect the sin of others will have a negative impact on my life. The sin of others will have a negative impact on my life. One of the things as a father that that just really brings a lot of soberness to my life, especially to my decisions, is I know that when I step out of the will of God and I don't do what God wants, I know who I'm going to bring suffering to, my family. I have seen it more than once. Somebody uh, gets out of the will of God. They decide, you know what? Church is not for me. I'm leaving. I'm going somewhere that, that has a more flowery message. I'm going somewhere the standards are a lot lower. I'm going somewhere where, you know what? I don't have to f- uh, a feel conviction and I don't have to feel uh, the true principles of the scriptures being pressed upon me. And so they run and what happens? Their children suffer greatly for it. And if you don't believe it, I can show you some Facebook pages that prove it. Listen, the sin of others will have a negative impact on my life. But here again, why is that a surprise to us? Why is it that we think, well, you know, God, I shouldn't have to suffer for so-and-so's sinful action. When it happened and it occurred all through the scriptures, when the apostle Paul himself says, this is what I'm going through. And if you think about it, this is why I'm going through it. So I have to expect the sin of others to have a negative impact on my life. But then I must reject, okay? I must reject their sin justifies my unrighteous reaction. Am I making sense this morning? Their sin justifies my unrighteous reaction. Listen, that's what I have to reject. I'm not telling you that principle so that you say, see, pastor said that that can occur in my life, and so now let me have it. No. When so-and-so does something wrong and you're negatively affected from it, it doesn't make you and your bad attitude, it doesn't make that right. It, It doesn't make your gossip right. It doesn't make your quitting right. It doesn't, it, whatever you, however you respond because of the sin of others, it doesn't make your bad attitude or bad mentality, it doesn't make it right. It doesn't make it right for me. And listen, I know that maybe I'm stepping on some toes right now, but I'm preaching to me as well. So can we just feel the pain together and know that pain's not always a bad thing? Their sin justifies my unrighteous reaction. That is false. We always say it like this. If they were right, then I could be right. Ah, if my people of this church were good church members, I would be a very godly pastor. I would be a very successful pastor. If my children just, if they weren't kin to their mother, then I would be a great father. Uh, Obviously, I can't say that right. My wife says, if it weren't for my husband, I'd be a wonderful wife. Uh, And then we go right down the list because why? We're quick to blame the others and their sin. God will deal with others regarding their sin. Those people that did those things to the Apostle Paul will have stood and given account for what they did in regards to the Apostle Paul. And I hate to say it, but their punishment will be far greater than anything that they they, uh, caused the Apostle Paul to experience or, or to feel. Uh, it, 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 we go right down that aspect of it and, and we try to blame others for what is going on in our life. And I understand, listen, I understand the reality is true. I wouldn't have to be going through this if you would be right with God. But it doesn't change 
my responsibility to have internal righteousness in a right relationship with the Lord. Now, how do I overcome this? I must accept this fact. I must accept the idea that, that really I need to develop a true understanding founded in faith. I need to develop a true understanding founded in faith. Look what he says here in verse 13. 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 13. We having the same spirit of what? Of faith. We having the same spirit of faith according as it is written. Now when it says it is written, what are we referring to? We're referring to the things of the word of God. Well, faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God, right? We recognize that that faith is founded in the very words of God. Our faith is built by God's word. So according as it is written, I believed, and therefore have I spoken. We also believe, and therefore we speak. So Paul's establishing the fact that, listen, all these things that have gone through, and yet nothing, is, uh, nothing has come about it as far as me uh, unrighteously sinning within my heart. Here, I have a founded upon faith and, and belief in the word of God. Verse 14, knowing... Knowing, now that's where that understanding comes from, the true understanding. Knowing that he which raised up the Lord Jesus shall raise up us also by Jesus and shall present us with you. Verse 15, for all things are for your sakes, that the abundant grace might, through the thanksgiving of many, redound to the glory of God. Now, what am I saying here? I'm going to develop a true understanding of what? True understanding of circumstance. True understanding of the sin of others. True understanding of the consequences of others. True understanding of what God might be doing in and through my life that must be founded upon faith. Because when I see a negative circumstance occur, when somebody has sinned, uh, let's take, for instance, a drunk driver. And when somebody has decided to drink alcohol, become inebriated, have a, uh, no longer sober, and they decide to get behind the wheel of a car, and they decide to drive, and as they're driving down the road, they cross the center line, and they hit my vehicle head on, and my family and I are now suffering in the hospital. What do I look? I look and say, you know what? That drunk driver sinned. He should not have been drinking. He broke God's law and he broke man's law. And I can become very angry. And I can become very bitter. And I can become almost where I'm incapacitated to be able to even serve God because I'm so eaten up with the situation and the sin that occurred. And I don't want that to happen. I don't want that to happen to anyone. I'm not hoping for that. But I'm looking at this and I'm saying, you know that sin was wrong and it's against God's word. But Christ died for that sinner. Wow, that's hard. Christ loves that individual. Christ went to the cross that that individual could have eternal life. That's a different understanding than what I'm focused on, right? And how does that understanding come? It comes when it's founded in faith, when I believe what God's Word says. Today, do you believe that all things work together for good to them that love God? To them that are called according to His purpose? Do you believe that? Do you believe it really says all, and when it says all, it actually means all? I mean, that's hard to really wrap our mind around sometimes, but if I have faith in the Word of God and I develop an understanding, then I can say, you know what? This external evil that has come upon me because of the sin of someone else, God can still use today to develop godly character in my life to help me to be able to give Him glory. And it says there, redound to the glory of God. I can still, through the abundant grace that He can provide me with, I can still maintain a godly spirit and a godly attitude and I can still have a godly focus and I can still let God work in and through this life. Isn't it an amazing testimony when you read how somebody went through some kind of tragedy and they chose the path of God and they let God work through them and work God, let God do the work within them and they come out and they say, praise be to God. And you're going, whoa, how do you do that? How is that's amazing? Our God is so wonderful. Again, that God can do the same thing in your life and in my life. And let me give you this last one here. Number three, the struggles. 
the struggles. We talked about the situation. We talked about the sin, but the struggles, all of these just essentially kind of uh, focusing on maybe a specific aspect of what we read there in verse 8 and 9. But those struggles that we go through uh, that can be depicted through trouble or perplexing or persecution or being cast down, we all face troubles or struggles in this life, don't we? I'm sure you had multiple struggles this week. But let's answer that aspect of it. First of all, expect. Expect opposition designed to prevent the work of God. Expect opposition designed to prevent the work of God. Why do I expect that? Well, part of it is because I've experienced it so much. But I see it in the life of Paul. You know why those people did what they did to the Apostle Paul? They wanted to stop the work of of God. They wanted to stop the preaching of Jesus Christ. No, don't say his name. No, don't preach in his name. Don't proclaim him to be the Messiah. He is not the Messiah. He didn't, he didn't deliver us from the Roman Empire. He's dead. Leave him out of the picture. Stop the work of God. And the opposition comes and all the struggles that happen. And I know sometimes in life we look at things and we're saying, well, I don't know if that's really opposition. But truthfully, there are a lot of things that really are and we just can't quite uh, put it all together. But even things that, like, that may happen in the household, you know, for us, Saturday nights is a bad time. Sunday mornings, and I'm talking about 1, 3 o'clock in the morning, is a bad time. Things happen. Difficulties come, uh, your sleep is interrupted for some reason or another. Uh, it used to be the dog, it's always sometimes, not, not always, every once in a while it's a child, sometimes it's our own things, it, it could be a multi, it's water pipes, I mean, whatever it is, it's opposition, it's difficulty, do I want those things to occur? No! But I do recognize that there is something that says, you know, when that occurs... There's probably a good chance that when I get up in the pulpit and the Lord works in and through my life, He's going to do something and praise Him for doing it. But if I let the opposition just stop me and say, oh, well, it's opposition, you know what? The Lord just doesn't want us to go to church today. I got to stay home and I take care of this and fix this and do this. And you know what? You guys are just going to have to watch a video. Some of y'all be like, yes. <laughs> So I expect opposition designed to prevent the work of God, but then I must reject the temptation to give up, to give in, or to walk away. I must reject the temptation to give up, to give in, or to walk away. Hey, when troubles, trials, struggles come, yes, there is part of us that says, I'm done with this. I don't want anything to do with it. I could not be living for God right now and experiencing a whole lot less turmoil. <laughs> and you know what I mean by that, right? Way of transgressor is hard. That's a whole different subject. It's a whole different category. But when we serve God, there's opposition. When the opposition gets hot, when the opposition gets heated, when it gets, when it gets uh, 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 accelerated on us, sometimes we just want to throw our hands up and say, I'm done, forget it, I'm walking away, I'm giving up, I'm done, it's not going to happen anymore. Reject that temptation. I'm so grateful today that Paul did not do that. That he did not forsake the way of God, but he kept on going, he kept on going, he kept on going. He took the stripes, he took the shipwreck, he took the perils, whatever it was, and he kept serving the Lord. And folks, we need to do the same thing. We need to take COVID-19 in stride. We need to keep serving God. We need to take whatever it is that comes against us and keep on serving the Lord. The temptation to give up must be rejected. And instead, we must accept this. We must accept the fact that we need to develop a true perspective abounded in eternal value. A true perspective abounded in eternal value. Too many times when things happen here, I get distraught, I get distressed, I get cast down. Why? Because this is my life. Folks, this is not our life. We are pilgrims and strangers on a journey. <laughs> And we have a citizenship that is not in this country. It's in a heavenly country. We have this is just but a vapor and this that is going to be forever and ever and ever and ever and ever and ever and ever again. 
And one day when I get up there, there'll be no more struggles. There'll be no more perplexing. There'll be no more persecutions. There'll be none of this kind of stuff. Why? Because it's going to be a perfect place in which God is going to rule. Man, that's something to get excited about and it's something that causes me then to have a different perspective on life because I recognize then the things that are happening here, you know what, it's just going to happen, it's going to go away, it's going to come, it's going to go away, it's going to come and go away and then one day it's all going to be done. And then the Lord's going to say, well done, now good and faithful servant, if you maintain that internal righteousness that says I'm going to keep serving him. Notice how Paul puts it here in verse 16. For which cause we what? Faint not. Nobody's fainting, right? We're not going to faint. We're not going to faint for lack of oxygen because of a mask on our face. We're not going to faint because of troubles and struggles that occur in our life. For this cause we faint, uh, uh, which cause we faint not. But though our outward man perish, yet what happens? The inward man is renewed day by day. Every day I'm in the scriptures, the Lord's speaking to me. He's renewing that spirit with inside of me. He's, he's speaking and communicating and uplifting and encouraging and, and whatever's come. Listen, I still can maintain a, a righteous perspective and a righteous walk and a righteous mindset and a righteous attitude and so on and so forth. For which cause we faint not, but though our outward man perish, yet the inward man is renewed day by day for our light affliction. Now I can't see. Paul, what is wrong with you? You missed something. That wasn't inspired by God. I would have said, for my extremely heavy affliction. What does he call it? Light affliction? I hate to see heavy if that's light. I haven't got to that degree yet. But for my, our light affliction, which is but for a, how long? Moment. Even if it lasts a few years, it's still but a moment. Is but uh, worketh for us a far more exceeding, and here it is, eternal weight of glory. It's a different perspective, an eternal perspective. While, here it is, we look not at the things which are seen, but at the things which are not seen. For the things which are seen are temporal, but the things which are not seen are eternal. That's a different perspective that you and I must develop in order to handle the struggle. So what is it? comes down to maintaining that internal, internal righteousness despite external evils. Develop a yielded will grounded in the sacrifice of Christ. Develop a true understanding founded in faith. Develop a true perspective abounded in eternal value. Father, today as we come before you, Lord, we're so grateful that you've blessed us with this time. Father, I'm so thankful that you've given us this subject to be able to cover and to be able to uh, understand and to grasp. And Lord, I know for a fact that many of us have experienced uh, difficulties in life. Many of us have gone through things that we've questioned. Many of us, maybe even on a very small scale, have been uh, negatively affected and, and, and unfortunately developed some bad attitudes. Father, today I trust that you'll Help us take these scriptures, take these principles, and work them within our heart. It brings about the result, Lord, of us truly being righteous individuals, despite those external evils. Guide this invitation, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's stand.